I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. There seemed to be a bit of hope in the ether when the uh, story broke today that Drew Harris has flown to the United Arab Emirates with the Assistant Commissioner Justin Kelly. Um, but I don't think they're going to be returning with the Kinahans in their no, bags. Not, no, in the Garda helicopter back from mm. Dubai. Um, no, I mean, obviously the background, the backdrop to this is that the file has been sent to the DPP Um regarding Daniel Kinnan, his father and his brother Christy Jr. And, you know, obviously what happens at the DPP is highly confidential. You don't always hear these things. So when it emerged today that 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 Drew Harris was on a plane to the UAE, it certainly sparked a bit of speculation mm. um, that something could be imminent. But at least you're hearing that it, that doesn't seem likely. No, I well, I certainly... I don't believe that the DPP has come back with directions regarding the Kinahans as of yet. Um, I think that when Drew Harris himself broke the story that um, the file had been sent to the DPP, it really wasn't long sent, shall we say. It was only, you know, perhaps a week or no, less. Anybody who's dealt with the DPP, you're really talking a six month minimum for any serious charge. Something like this that is inevitably going to be hugely complex it wouldn't be surprising if it went a good lot longer. Because the DPP, of course, has to, and the DPP's office, because it's not just one individual, yeah. um, has to read every page of that file, has to consider how that's going to go in court, um, what the likelihood is of getting a conviction, what the charges should be, because, yeah. um, you know, included in the file is all sorts of, of information and investigations around the Kinahans, which has happened really over certainly a seven year period. And probably it it it, it is also reaching back even further, um, you know, the file, the complexities of that file to their activities in Ireland, to their activities in Spain and to what they are believed to have directed from Dubai. Yeah, and I mean, often I think, as far as I'm aware, the DPP will ask maybe for, you know, they'll read something in the file, they'll test it to a degree, they might ask the guards for clarifications, if there's other forms, other documents, that type of that type of thing. Obviously, then there's there's legal advice that they receive, mm -hmm. both, you know, from within the organisation themselves uh, about, you know, it wouldn't be down to one person, I think, that would just make that decision, as you said. So, but you would imagine this is Drew Harris flying out is setting the scene, is it? Sort of. Possibly. Um, it's possibly slightly overdue. Yeah. I would have thought, um, you know, has he been to the Emirates on this kind of business before? The fact that he's traveling with the Assistant Commissioner, Justin Kelly, who is over the Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau, who have been the 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 section of the Gardaí who've conducted this massive investigation into the Kinahan organisation who've already somewhat dismantled it here in this country and who ha whose investigations have resulted in the jailing of, you know, up to 70 members of the cartel here in Ireland. I mean, like in the background of this as well, there are, the UAE, I think even last week, they had an interview with with one of their justice spokespeople about cleaning up the UAE, about specifically these, uh, it was really referring to money laundering. They put out uh, a press release. They had a, a conference of some type, put out a press release saying there was they were down on 40% of suspicious payments. And they, of course, have, the EU have uh, not sanctioned them, but put them on a blacklist. Mm -hmm. So... That's the other bit of it. The UAE are trying to come off that, trying to sort of regularize and improve their reputation. And so they are meeting European police forces or European politicians. They have representatives it. now in in Europe and Irish Gardaí were certainly advertising 
um, yeah. in the last year for a representative to travel to and to be based in Dubai, which is obviously uh, a huge, significant thing. Um, we already have an individual from the guards. I don't think he's been named based in Colombia. Yeah. And I think um, Drew Harris has gone to Colombia uh, and that visit was to meet with his own yeah, you you know, member that's based out there. So, um, you know, is this visit going to be very political, or is he going there to lay the basis for this new relationship? I suppose with the guy. Well, I think he's the... probably probably laying laying in the groundwork for who to contact and all all of those things. And obviously, uh, the politics behind this is is a is a, a part of it. Now they didn't they did give a statement the guards, mm. um, they didn't specifically mention. Uh, you know what they were, you know what basically what they said was transnational organized crime gangs not only cause death and misery in the countries they originate from, but also in communities across the globe. Tackling these gangs protect people here in Ireland and abroad. And as part of these efforts, Commissioner Harris and senior guardy, senior guard officers regularly liaise and work with international law enforcement partners to disrupt and dismantle these gangs. This includes the ongoing multinational operation devised by Angarda Siakana to tackle the Guinean transnational organised crime gang. Mm -hmm. So they're not... Uh, Suggesting that there's any more to it than, I suppose, a little bit of politics and a show of the top command in the yeah, country Yeah, I think they're probably helping put pressure yeah. on it for if the file comes back from the DPP and charges are recommended that this is already in the media and, you know, obviously the UAE, do, they really do have an interest in cleaning up their reputation. Uh, whether they have an interest in cleaning up uh, the actual level of criminality involved in the, in, in, in the country is another matter, but they certainly have an interest in, in the PR side of it. And they are regularly uh, out there talking about um, stamping down on this type of uh, criminal criminality within the within their their borders the real test will come of course when and if those charges do come back as directions from the dpp yeah because at the moment in this country we don't officially have any of those Kinahan's father or sons were not actually wanted yet on yeah. charges um the Hope is contained within that file, which is with the DPP. And if that comes back, levelling charges against them, we're in a totally different ball game with the UAE then. Yeah. You know, it's at that point when that comes back. And I think we're probably looking into 2024. Yeah. Um, if you're six months. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's... Average is, is accurate. Yeah. We're looking into 2024. It's at that point, really, that it'll be tested whether the UAE are protecting them or are going to hand them back. Yeah, and of course, then there's appeals processes and all of that, which you can't see them uh, agreeing to extradition easily or quickly. Mm. With so much at stake, and obviously, we've seen in in the cases like like Jerry Hutch and and you know other people in European arrest warrants, it's really become uh, a pointless fight. Really, if somebody is arrested within the EU, they're nearly always extradited pretty quickly. But it could be a very different matter coming from Dubai. Though it has to be said, a lot of uh, criminals from the UK, um, once the extradition process well, began, it was successful. Spain is a funny old place, isn't it? It is, it is, yeah. Um, I say that, of course, because this week John Gilligan um, found himself before a Spanish judge along with Tony Armstrong and other members of his uh Organization, organization, and they did a plea deal, and uh, nobody got jail. Yeah, so it was only a bit of cannabis, a few and, sleeping pills, and an L gun, gun. <laughs> and an L gun as well. <laughs> I mean, my goodness, why would you be putting anyone before the courts? Yeah. It's you know, well, he has a perfect record. Oh, yeah, oh, no, he doesn't. Oh, no, he doesn't either. Yeah. Anecdotally, um, and you know, obviously, this would be coming from the ground level, shall we say, from yeah. people operating in criminal circles in yeah. Spain. Nobody's ever afraid of going before a court in Spain if they're caught with cannabis. Yeah. They have a totally different attitude to cocaine. Yeah. But traditionally, and I'm talking back 20 odd years, 
they have pretty much dealt with anybody caught with cannabis or smuggling cannabis as a kind of a bit of a rap on the knuckles and off you go. Yeah, I mean, it is. I, I suppose that bit is an extraordinary. And obviously the sleeping tablets uh, was another part of the case, 10,000 sleeping tablets, which again, as anybody who's been to Spain will know that the law surrounding medicines is, are totally different. I yeah. mean, people can go into chemists and order all sorts of things that you couldn't do over here. So maybe that contributed to it. But I thought the gun might have given it a different flavour, to be honest. Uh, well, so did I think the police who yeah. arrested uh, Gilligan. And, you know, there was quite a lot of noise made about that arrest and about that gun, because initially the the gun was very similar to the one used in the shooting of Veronica Guerin. And I think initially the police in Spain were kind of convinced that it was the gun and they believed that that Gilligan had somehow kept it close to him. Um, he's obviously been on television this week denying he'd anything to do with her murder and didn't order it and didn't really care about it. It had nothing to do with him. Yeah. But uh, the police in Spain at the time were quite excited and sent it to ballistics uh, in the hopes that it was the gun. I think Irish police at the time were kind of less hopeful yeah. and they believed that there was no way that even if John Gilligan did have the gun that was uh, used in the murder of Veronica Guerin that he would have kept it so long or so close to him. No, I mean, Gilligan was, of course, caught after a very major operation. It wasn't as if they sort of stopped him in a car and found stuff it Was in this him. last year or the year before? This was 2020, so yeah. as far as I remember. So it's three years ago now. Y yeah. The time flies. Yeah, it was it was in 2020. Because he was initially kept in custody, Gilligan. Yeah. Um, interestingly, Virgin Media had another documentary about Gilligan at the time, which was released. The documentary was released on a Monday, the day he got bail. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure anybody was totally aware that he was due uh, in court the day the Virgin Media documentary went out this time round. No, I think the, the producer did say that on Virgin Media last night that they, they knew it was coming up but they didn't know it was on the day itself. Um, I think the, the reality is in Spain that um, if you get under two years imprisonment you more or less uh, are guaranteed a suspended sentence. I'm not sure exactly how it works but that seems to be the way it is. Um, so we, yeah, he walked out the day of the, the controversial documentary aired on, on Virgin Media. Mm. And on his way in, smirked as usual for the cameras. I mean, yeah. he is a particularly dislikable character. He he never shows any particular respect. In fact, the opposite. Um, but interesting little bit of video that we showed at the beginning of this on the YouTube channel uh, was Tony Armstrong coming out of the court. Yeah. He cut some figure, didn't he, Mr. He did. Armstrong? He did. I mean, he's another uh, sort of survivor. Um Obviously, he was arrested in connection with the murder of the two leaders of the Westies in the 2000s. Remind us of that now. Um, they led a gang in, in the Blanchardstown area, a uh, very violent gang. Jane Coates and Jane, Stephen Sugg. Jane Coates and Stephen Sugg. I couldn't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday, <laughs> but I can remember their names. They were they were kind of an up-and-coming gang, younger guys. Um, they very much controlled, uh, using extreme violence, a sort of network of street dealers. Um, they managed to, you know, rise up to the top to a degree, but really they became more famous for, you know, really violent attacks on addicts over very, very small amounts of money sometimes. Um, eventually they fell out with the criminal fraternity and fled to Spain. They did, funny enough, what um, the the monkey gang, I'm talking to our colleague yeah. Ken Foy about them this week and what they're currently doing. They basically started issuing a directive that anybody who wanted to deal in their area had to buy from them. Yeah. And they set the price and anybody who was buying elsewhere was punished or were certainly told under no uncertain terms that, you know, they were going to end up in intensive care if they didn't buy from them. There were stories about, um, you know, addicts owing 100 euro being held by their ankles off Ballymun Towers. There was horrendous stories of people being cut. Um, huge sort of violence that was almost torture. Yeah, it was it was outplaced to the level of money involved and it was totally um you know it was totally it was to uh, spread fear. It was to spread fear and which they really, really did. However, they ended up in Spain and the sort of tactics and style of of criminality that they've been 
able to get away with within a sort of a relatively small part of of the capital uh, didn't wash, um, and they disappeared off the scene. There was a lot of rumors. They're dead. They're not dead. They're gone here. They're gone there. Went on for ages. They were being spotted at sometimes in Thailand. I remember and. You know, various stories like that were popping up, but ultimately, um, they were found buried in concrete in uh, in a warehouse outside Catral. Yeah, there it goes. More there you go. of the, my. Yeah. Somebody should actually take my brain out and examine it. How I can remember <laughs> that, and really, I'm forgetful about other stuff. But they, yeah, they did. I mean, they they got involved in a feud. Their act, their I think they were so prolific, so quick, so greedy here, so determined to take over that turf that they their own gang imploded. Yeah. And they sort of went to war with themselves as such. Yeah, there was a there was a quite a violent feud went on in, in Blanchard Sound from something equivalent to the Crumlin and Drimna feud where the one gang disintegrated and there was a number of murders and ultimately they you know, they, they did, fled for they their fled. lives essentially. Yeah. But they they embedded themselves in Alicante. Yeah. Um which was obviously Gilligan turf. Yeah. Um, it was where Gilligan had famously had his pub, the judge's chambers, where he had properties. I mean, we have an address for him now where he still has a villa out there on the Costa Blanca. Alicante, for anyone who doesn't know, is about five hours around about drive from the Marbella area. It's a it's a big distance, you know. Yeah. That's the Costa Blanca, whereas the, the Marbella Porta Banus area is the Costa del Sol. Um, but they went to Alicante and there was pictures presumably coming off social media at the time of them you know obviously they were drug users they were taking E yeah. dancing the night yeah. away they liked the whole lifestyle the sunshine the women the fast cars they had bought villas or certainly were living in very fancy villas and the story was and like all stories in yeah. gangland we never totally get to the bottom of it but the story was that they had purchased uh, some drugs from the old Gilligan network yeah. and tried to double cross them. Yeah. Um, now, Tony Armstrong was arrested after the bodies were discovered, but he was released without charge. Yeah, he was ultimately, um, uh, you know, in, in Spain, he remained a person, like as they do, they, they arrest people. They don't charge them like we do in Ireland. He was declared a person of interest and ultimately undeclared a person of interest. Yeah. And, and um, obviously... The murders remain unsolved to this day, and I imagine they're not going to be solved anytime soon either. But isn't it amazing that, you know, after Gilligan was so long in prison, um, that he was able to kind of, after being shot, of course, and and going to ground for that period of time, he was able to, in his late 60s, and he's now 72 or 73 or something, go back out to the Costa Blanca, to Alicante, hook up again with Armstrong and get up and running again as a drug dealer. Up and running, um, but he was caught with two kilograms of cannabis ultimately mm. um, and 10,000 sleeping tablets. Far cry from what he would have. Yeah, because if you watched the programme last night and he was talking about 100 kilos mm. worth and, you know, and more, but that's what he was dealing in. And like it's, you know. I thought what was very telling in the arrest of Gilligan in Spain in 2020 was the fact that the drugs were in his house. Yeah. You know, they were actually in his house where he was living, as was the gun buried outside. Just questionable about what that gun was doing, what it was there for, um, why the courts in Spain would have taken such a lax view and seen it as a... Look, they described it as a plea deal was done. Yeah. Gilligan, Armstrong and others went into the court. Um, there was talking between the lawyers and they ultimately came out free men with suspended sentences and a fine, I think. Yeah, I think 14,000. Yeah, 14,000. So, um, yeah, that's that's it. I mean, it's it, over here. You would think that um, even due to the minimum sentencing that was brought in actually for because of John Gilligan, uh, because of the crackdown and the Gilligan gang, um, there was a, a law brought in that if you had over 13,000 euros worth of drugs, you were meant to serve a minimum sentence of 10 years, is it? Um, you know, it's rarely adhered to in that strict way because judges do have discretion. So, but, you know, John Gilligan had enough probably to hit that, that, uh, mm. that magic number. Now, you have watched the first have, of the Gilligan have. trilogy. Um, I had watched it the last yeah. time we spoke about it and you hadn't. So, what did you think? I thought it was... Uh, 
you know, I think the it, it's it's a funny piece of of work. I think on a journalistic level, if you watch it, obviously the 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 great uh, um, criticism of it is that it glorifies John Gilligan. Having watched it and watched it carefully, I don't think that really. No, that I don't glorify that, word is overused I, I, I when don't, it comes to crime journalism. Yeah, well, I don't think even. He's not glorified. No, even in this case, you know, if you look, maybe there are glorification in 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 some pieces of journalism, but I don't think this does. I don't think it, you know, it gives them a free ride. Um, I don't think it uh, makes them look attractive or smart. Uh, so I don't think the glorification thing stands up. I think also Veronica Guerin's family are entitled to criticise it. Nobody could say that they they wouldn't. I'm sure um, they're not happy and that's their right. So I don't think journalistically there's there's a lot to, to criticise. Um, but whether it's uh, really, you really... You learn a lot, some facts, and there's some interesting tales. Whether you really get under the skin of, of John Gilligan, I don't know that you do either. I don't think that there's. So I understand what you were saying is that it's probably as as in in terms of his his motivations and his psychology and some of the stuff that you would find interesting. That because we do know the facts of John Gilligan's life, yeah. pretty much already. We haven't heard it necessarily in his own words. But we know all the things that happened. They spoke about the drug dealing and we know all about drugs coming into Cork and, you know, all of that. Um, so I don't think it probably works in that way. So is that... I was saying to you, having watched the um, the preview, that I felt that the makers of this programme were knowing there was going to be criticism of that level, that, you know, they're, you know, they're giving them free reign yeah. to speak whatever. So in order to negate that, they wrapped a load of voices around him. Yeah. Whereas in actual fact, it might have been more interesting had we just had Gilligan and followed him and been able to come to conclusions ourselves at the end of it. Now, Gilligan is such a toxic character. And I said that to you as well. Yeah. Could you have actually done that? I don't know if Have he... you seen television yeah. before being the subject of the Minister for Justice comments. <laughs> well, I mean, there probably, there probably is every now and again. Um, there was three ministers time. spoke out I about know. this programme. And in fairness to before Virgin Media. Before it was shown, and exactly. In, in fairness to Virgin Media, they they, they criticise it before seeing it. Exactly, which, is, you, what, you which is just, I mean, that annoyed me. Yeah. To be honest with you, because I cannot stand when people do that criticism before they actually yeah. watch the thing. You know, form your own opinion. And then, and like, Again, that's probably why that glorifying, that word yeah, I mean, glorifying think, was thrown out because it's so easy just to say that and especially without having watched it and come to no, it. No, no, I think, I think, look, I think it, there's there's one criticism is journalistically, I think it was managed. And um, then the other criticism is whether it's like a really good piece of television or not. And that's really a subjective opinion, isn't it? Yeah. Um, um, I don't know if there is more to John Gilligan than what you see. Maybe like, you know, you like, I don't think there mm. is a sort of self-reflection or there's there's a really interesting. Actually, there was an interesting bit. Um, I think it was Michael O'Sullivan said he was talking about criminals and he said they're not smart. Did you remember that bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought that was interesting because John Gilligan is a great example of somebody who's not particularly smart, interesting, you know, insightful. He ran rings around everybody. Well, maybe, years. maybe. But to an he, extent he did. Yeah, but a lot of if you look. And and that program again, like he ran rings around them because he was willing to use extreme violence against innocent people like witnesses. Mm. And, and you know, they talked about a couple of cases collapsing for that reason. But I think he had a fair point. He's not that interesting. I don't think no. he has anything massively uh, interesting to say as a as a human being. Mm -hmm. He has interesting stories to tell. Um, Did you feel any empathy for him about, around his childhood? Uh, I, th I always think if you see somebody, you can feel empathy for him. I thought it felt some empathy for him when he talked about, you know, he's robbing factories and he wasn't killing people. I sort of thought, well, you know, but I think the bit, the problem with John Gilligan is he lies when it suits him and that robs mm. you of any, having any empathy for him because, he, you know, he was talking about mm. Martin Cahill 
you know, great guy, Martin Cattle, you know, what was his own role in Martin Cattle's demise, you know, and then obviously his stuff about Veronica Guerin doesn't ring true. And of course, the fact that John or Martin Cattle's death really set him on um, his career because, of course, he would have owed him money yeah. for that very first shipment he got in. And having got it in, sold it, he didn't have to pay the debt. Yeah. So he was on the front foot yeah, so going I think, forward. I think all those those kind of lies mm. rob you of sympathy for him or empathy for him or yeah. kind of understanding. I found it hard to find the empathy in myself when he was talking about his child, which was unlike me. You know, I usually can sort of feel a sense of, you know, they they were, it was unjust how difficult things were for some of these families, that his father was violent. I've no doubt that bit of it is true. And he had to, in the home, as a young person, defend his mother and his sisters against this violent father. But there's something about the way he delivers everything. Well, he, Gilligan, he's a, a he's smirk. A, it's the kind yeah, of the smart arse comments. And it's, is, and it's the, you know, it's the desire always to appear to be on top of yeah. whoever, mm. uh, the guards, the other criminals, you know, well, whoever. He, was, whoever he, he's he made hay with the Spanish courts anyway, that's for sure. And, you know, the funny thing is um, around the time that he was getting bail, which was some months after he had been arrested in Spain with those tablets and the um, the the cannabis. Um, his daughter, Tracy, contacted me to tell me that he was going to get bail. And she also told me that he wasn't going to serve a day in prison. No, no. They knew that long ago. And the Spanish system seems to be that way. Uh, predictable is the yeah. word I'm going to use as opposed to anything else. I'm not saying corruptible necessarily, no. but predictable. Yeah. Um, and there was a confidence about him all the way along with that. Um, I don't think that same confidence would have existed in other countries, even in Europe, facing those charges. No, I think in Ireland, look, he would have gone to prison no matter what. The UK. Uh, you know, and in the UK, you see huge sentences. Mm. Um, so Anyway, he might just still wash up in some anchor chat. Who knows? I don't know if you see that. Can't see him being the anchor chat type of guy. Can you? Can you not? No, no, really? don't think he uses, no, no, don't think no. He, no. He uses an old style phone or whatever. Awesome. Anyway, he's back there now living in the Costa Blanca, having had a huge amount of publicity mm. again. Everyone knows where he is. I'm not sure that's a very comfortable place for somebody involved in organised crime to be. But unless it's just a desire to be the centre of attention, I think mm. is that is that what it's all about? Like they did, I think. What is the motive for him to do all this? And is it just as simple as that? Every opportunity. Do you remember the um, in recent times as well? There was the video of him drinking with yeah. some yeah. some guys from Dublin celebrating or certainly raising a pint. I think it was the anniversary of Veronica Guerin's yeah. murder. Um, so yeah, he he sort of doesn't. I mean, if he is looking for to be liked. I don't think that's no happening or going to work for no, him. I don't think so. And I mean, and then, you know, what is the purpose of it? But maybe he does feel he's, he, you know, he's going to be able to manipulate the program makers sufficiently to come out as, mm. you know, a Robin Hood type of character. But I don't think that is going to happen. And I wonder how it was viewed and if that's going to be the end of it, you know, the end of the talk about it or will it, you know, will the next couple of episodes make it more intriguing? Will it be, would you, are you drawn back for the next one? I, I definitely watch it. Yeah. I will watch it. And, you know, it's not that, um, you know, I can understand the criticisms of it. I mean, we, I understand the criticisms of things in the Sunday world. Yeah. Like, you're people, such an understanding guy. Well, people can be critical, you know, yeah. and they have a right, you know, if you put, if you put something out there, mm -hmm. criticism is part of it. Um, But I, I think they was, journalistically, I think it was, absolutely justifiable um, but look other people will have different opinions mm. okay now thank you thank you very much